thank you pete for the interesting talk uh we have several questions coming in from the audience and without any delay i'll start uh picking up question uh, so, Pete, uh, the first question is about the nine planetary boundaries uh, that you shared, and you shared that six of the nine planetary boundaries have crossed their limits. So, as someone working in the area of sustainability, could you please share some ray of hope or optimism in your thoughts uh, in how these boundaries could be reclaimed? Okay, well, that's a fantastic question. And, and, and actually, I think I'm consistently energized with hope that we as practicing scientists can understand that the delicate balances that these planetary boundaries indicate are sacrosanct. We cannot continue to abuse them. Yeah. And, and I think it's really important to say that as chemists and, and molecular scientists, we are the community of people that are trusted to make and break bonds. We are the community of people that are trusted to make new products, new molecules, to deliver function and to deliver effect. It's incumbent upon us to start to understand what the real impact of a molecule is. And the real impact of a molecule is, is not just the impact that it was designed to deliver, because the molecule doesn't just go to sleep when it's delivered that function. It persists in the environment, it lives in the environment, and it interacts with complex systems that are around it. So what we must do is we must design molecules that have high efficacy when we need them to, but that we can deactivate them or we can deconstruct them or we can recycle them and reuse them in a really, really smart way, such that they do not increase in concentration in the environment. They don't become recalcitrant and cause problems that we didn't think about. So there's a, a concept which is growing in momentum called responsible research and innovation. And this uses a framework, and this is called the area framework, which, which asks us to anticipate problems. So when we're designing a molecule, we should think about all of the potential things that that molecule could do. It might not just be a molecule that helps us to control birth rate. It might have a whole range of different things. Yeah, And we should try to anticipate it and perhaps if we are worried about it, build in functionality in that molecule so that we can turn it off. We can undergo retro Diels-Alda. We can undergo hydrolysis. We can understand the degradative pathways that we can build into that molecule so that we can trigger them at end of life. I think it's incumbent upon us to do this because if we don't, we're going to get into deeper trouble than we're in right now. We're, we're living in a microcosm of life where Everybody is striving to be better. Everybody is striving to be faster. Everybody is striving to be the best. And we're putting too much stress on our environment. So we have to be smarter with the materials that we use. And we need to be better at designing the materials of the future. And we've really got to start to play the game of stewardship, which is to use it for now and then give it back. So the technological challenges range from making new functionalities that can deliver impact but only in a single way and not in an orthogonal way in other ecosystems so that's about understanding interactions it's about understanding modeling and it's about understanding the complexity of life and i think that you know if we if we think about nitrogen we've got to fix nitrogen in a better way so that we don't emit more co2 to the environment so is that about better harbor bosch or is that about a fixation that's different to Harbour Bosch, making larger molecules rather than ammonia. It's about changing the way that we do chemistry, changing the building blocks we use to make chemistry and changing the functionalities that we develop to make chemistry work for us. So I hope that addresses the question. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Pete, for sharing your thoughts on that. Uh, as an add-on question to that, Pete, uh, as someone working in the area of sustainability, again, is there any particular area where the implementation of sustainability chemistry practice has been really challenging? Well, I would say that implementing change in any chemical manufacturing process is always challenging because the industry itself is incredibly conservative and it's conservative for a number of different reasons. But I think one of the most significant reasons is that the cost of manufacturing molecules on scale is, is really quite significant. And it requires large capital investments to make 
infrastructure, plants, factories, refineries, such that the lifetime of those is incredibly long. And to do change, to change a chemical process may mean a change in that capital infrastructure. And what that means is that infrastructure has to be written off and new investment needs to be made to embrace new technologies, which may well be continuous processes. They may well be photochemistry. They may well be electrochemistry. But what we should do as our generation is insist that when change comes to the chemical industry, that we make change for a better technology. And we don't just deploy the technology that we've used in the past because we know that that works. Yeah, We've got to be brave to buy back our future and we cannot let these barriers remain in the way. Yeah, uh, thank you, Pete. Uh, so I see that we have a couple of questions on the journal and uh, because you are an editor of an ACS journal, so I'll pick up a question based on that. Given your expertise as an editor, and a prolific author, of course, what would be your recommendation to put data that is negative or data that is not so good? Well, that's a fantastic question. And I think it's an important question that we as a community need to debate. The important thing about science is that science is about celebration of data. When we write a paper, it gives an interpretation and it allows us to communicate our learning when we've consulted that data. Yeah. And I personally am an exponent that all data should be published because then other people can use that data. Other people can learn from that data. And if we're going to publish data, we have to publish all of the data, not just the data that allows us to tell the nice story. Yeah. The positive data that allows us to, to drive a positive hypothesis. The negative data is really important because, in, you know, in its most brutal sense, it says, I tried this experiment and it didn't work. And that's a great big flag to the rest of the community that says, you don't need to try this again because it didn't work. And what that can do is it can save a lot of time, a lot of energy, and it can save a lot of material. So that's the first thing it can do. The next thing that it can do is that it can be used by a computer. It can be used by an algorithm so that it can learn from that data. And one of the biggest problems that I think is happening at the moment with AI and machine learning is that the data sets that are available are only positive. How can the computer even understand what a negative result tells us? How can it tell us a truthful and an honest and an open answer if it doesn't know what's going wrong? Yeah. So I think unless we as a society change the appreciation for the value of data, yeah, then we're not really going to be able to harvest the true benefits of using computational chemistry, using machine learning, deep learning, whatever the mechanism is to help us make decisions. At the end of the day, you know, I'm the way I've always acted as a, as a practitioner is I measure spectroscopy and I publish the absolute raw data, the data set. In my paper, I would tell you about the interpretation, what I think the data tells me. But I will always give the data to the community so that later when I'm gone, the experiment continues. The data is there still. People can look at it and they can look at the bits of data that I didn't know what to look at. So I really believe that experiments are living and they live forever. I do an experiment and I can publish the data and many people can learn from it. And I've, I'd rather hope that more people would would appreciate that in the future. You know, science like we often think of a of a paper as as being an introduction, a methodology section, some conclusions, and then your data. And often they're sold as stories. I designed an experiment to do this, and guess what? It it worked. Yeah. Well, to me that's a boring paper because it tells me that I didn't learn anything. What I really like in science is the experiments that are negative, the experiments that remind me that I don't know it all, that, that we as a community don't know it all. And without those indicators of the negative data, then, you know, I think we do have to change. So, so in our journal, I really would value supporting information, which has got the original data, which has got the negative experiments as well as the positive experiments. Because one, they tell us what not to try and repeat or two, how we can learn from it in the fullest sense, not just the positive outcomes. So that was a very long answer because I'm very passionate about this topic, but I hope people got, got what they wanted from it. 
thank you thank you pete for sharing your honest thoughts on that uh pete you have talked about the use of ai and machine learning for uh, a better sustainable uh, chemical space so could you share some challenges that ai brings it with itself well of course ai and machine learning is a relatively new topic to many of us in the field of molecular sciences and discovery so so we're like learners. We don't really know all of the power, all of the opportunities that are there. And I think the one thing which is going to be challenging for us is is possibly over extrapolating what is possible and, and over expecting what we think could be possible. So I think that that's definitely a pitfall. And I also have quite strong reservations and concerns. Of positive so so, th so there are problems there are challenges and i think that that we should walk carefully and walk slowly not run into this topic and and take the best advice as possible from from the computer scientists and the data scientists that understand this topic a lot more the challenge I think for us as chemists is is finding the translators, finding the Rosetta Stone for the translation of that computational knowledge into the land of molecules, into the land of materials. And similarly, molecular scientists and material scientists explaining the challenge to the computational people so that we use the most appropriate technologies, the most appropriate routes and get the better levels of confidence in the predictions that we can can use. So I think it's a it's an exciting topic and it's a topic that I think I want to know more about. Yeah. And for me, that says that there's a huge opportunity. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Pete. Uh, the next question, Pete, is on uh, flow chemistry API formulations that you have shown in your presentation. Mm -hmm. How do we ensure that these are also cost effective? Well, you know, it's it's an interesting thing because for something to be truly sustainable, there has to be a, a, a societal requirement. There has to be uh, an environmental win and there also has to be an economic imperative. And I can tell you from my own bitter experience in, earlier in my career, I worked with a company in the United Kingdom doing reduction chemistry, so hydrogenation at scale. And the chemistry that we delivered was was fantastic. It was incredibly selective. We were doing hydrogenation in high pressure carbon dioxide as solvent. So the, the environmental benefits were fantastic. The, the need for the molecules that we were making was, was clear and evidenced. But the process itself was so economically challenging that unfortunately it never really got off the ground in terms of, of manufacturing. So what we need to be very, very mindful for is a full evaluation of techno-economic analysis of the process before we move out from the laboratory towards the, the semi-preparative land and then on into production. Because we can waste too much time understanding the challenges of scale when the economics are clearly not there. And it could just be on something which is totally unrelated, like the cost of energy, which could knock your process to the floor very, very quickly. What I will say, though, is as we move from traditional batch style chemistries towards flow type chemistries, particularly now that we've gone through the energy crisis, the efficiency of heating and cooling a small mass flow reactor is much, much lower than it is for for heating or cooling a large batch scale reactor. So so the 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 reliance on energy costs certainly makes flow chemistry a lot more um viable and technology tech techno economically a viable process and of course the ability to to generate reactive intermediates and, and energetic compounds in small scale flow reactors is a lot safer than making them in bulk and making them in in stirred tanks so i think that a full evaluation of the energetics the kinetics and the techno economic analysis is certainly a prerequisite to scale up and it's something that i think is 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 high on the priority list for activities when we think that a process could go to scale. I'm a very much a firm believer that that sustainable chemistry is smart chemistry. It's green chemistry. 
but it's green chemistry that's practiced in industry. It's demonstrably used in making molecules that impact the lives and the, the lifestyle of people. The chemistry that we do could be very elegant, but if there's a reason why it cannot be used at scale, then it fails the stress test in terms of its impacts and it fails the stress test in terms of sustainability for me. And I think that that's an important thing that we must always reflect on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you, uh, Pete. Uh, there's another question on toxicity. Uh, you have shown your work on the formation of amides. Uh, so uh, how do you ensure that the process takes care of the toxicity of the chemicals used in the reaction? Or in general, how crucial it is for us to consider the toxicity factor in all our synthetic protocols? I think it's absolutely imperative because... You know, the principles of green chemistry tell us that we shouldn't use materials that are energetic or things that will cause us harm or, or damage. And, and you know, what that does is it says that the molecules that we're using have got a biological interaction and, and they, they can, can interact with our body and can interact with the way that we live. Yeah? So if we are going to expose ourselves or expose other people to it, then we really must understand that toxicological impact. So I find it really hard to understand how in the future we could have a, a chemistry degree, for instance, which doesn't teach us about molecular toxicology and interactions with biology. And I think that an, an intrinsic understanding of that mechanistic impact on a molecular level is really important for the skill sets of the chemists for the future. Where we are right now, very few chemists really appreciate the comp the, the complexity of, of 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 toxicology and and for practicing scientists now i really do think that bedtime reading should be toxicology 101 so that we can get up to speed so that we can start to become responsible to take responsibility for the molecules that we use you know the important thing like you know if we were to imagine having a pet if my pet was a cat i know that the cat's not going to damage anybody i know the cat might get angry and scratch you yeah but the cat's well controlled. We understand the risk profile. We understand the hazard and we can then limit the exposure if we need to. Now, if my pet was a tiger, then the hazard and risk are very, very different to if I had a domestic cat. And I would need licenses and skills to be able to hold that cat, that tiger. Molecules are just like cats and tigers. Some of them are very innocuous, but some of them can bite you really, really hard. Yeah. And if you don't have the skill sets, you shouldn't have a tiger, yeah. And I'll just leave it there. Thank you, thank you, Pete, for that interesting analogy. Uh, we are almost uh, beyond our time schedule, so I'd request you to uh, deliver your closing remarks, especially uh, to early career researchers who wishes to initiate sustainable chemistry or engineering approaches in their research. Uh, could you please share your advice in the way they can identify relevant problems and stick to sustainable solutions. Well, Mahir, that is probably one of the most difficult questions that anyone's ever asked me. But I can tell you from my learning, I can tell you from the way that I've found my career. Yeah, I found my career by being brave and not being afraid to take on new subject areas. So my PhD was in organic chemistry. My first postdoc was in high pressure chemistry. My next postdoc was in energetics. The next activity was in ultra high vacuum chemistry. I've always looked to collect new skills so that I can understand problems from very, very different axes. By reading, by learning about the diversity of science and the challenges of our society, we can identify what the really hard questions are. So the hard questions are about circularity. The hard questions are about activating molecules that are in thermodynamic sinks. The hard questions are about understanding interactivity because in the naivety of my earlier career, I didn't understand complexity. I didn't understand that once the paracetamol has gone from my body, it's in the water because the effect had been measured, you know, the headache had gone, but then I excreted it into the environment. What's the impact there? I never thought about things that were outside of 
of my initial conditioning. So being a lifelong learner, looking for new skill sets, not being afraid to talk to people, not being afraid to ask questions of people and driving multidisciplinarity. The best thing I ever did was to make friends with a chemical engineer because the chemical engineer and the chemist are very, very different. They speak different languages, but if you can learn to speak and communicate together, then that relationship is a relationship that will drive you for a long time. So I suppose my advice is to be brave, to read widely, and to expose yourself to as many different unusual things as possible. And if we think about biology and nature, Darwinian theory or Darwinian culture tells us that if we don't place ourselves under pressure, we won't evolve. So place yourself under pressure, then you'll evolve. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pete, for the wonderful talk and for sharing your honest uh, thoughts and insights in the Q&A session. Uh, thank you. Thank you very Krishna, much. Over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Professor License. You know, that was really insightful, the way you had, you know, all those nice things to say. And it really made a lot of context. And specifically, as like a petroleum engineer, a chemical engineer, it was really hard thing that you said that, yeah, chemists and chemical engineers need to be friends. <laughs> thank you for that Absolutely. comment. Sure. So with this, we come to the end of today's session. Uh, we hope that you really enjoyed this broadcast and we invite you to view the edited recordings from the past events in the ACS Science Talks lib uh, library. At the end of the session, you'll receive a brief survey for your feedback so that you can share with us so that we can continue to improve our programming for the betterment. And uh, as a closing remark, I'd like to thank our speaker, Professor License, for his time and his energetic you know, uh, presentation. Really insightful. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, on behalf of ACS, thank you so much for joining us. And until our next time, stay safe, stay healthy. Bye-bye.